When you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. There was once a young man, and he wanted to become immensely wealthy. He wanted ineffable amounts of riches. He wanted to reach such a level of opulence that while some wanted, say, tubs of riches, he wanted oceans. And to find out how this was to be done, he went to a guru, a financial guru. And if you can imagine, he traveled across oceans, up mountains, through valleys, jungles, forests, and he finally arrived at a single solitary house on a hill. And he found the guru there, and he said, I want to be on the same level you're on. And the guru, after stroking his beard, said, if you want to be on the same level I'm on, I'll see you tomorrow morning at 4 a.m. at the beach. And so immediately, the young man set off, traveling back up mountains, through valleys, jungles, forests, across oceans, and he arrived ready to make money, hadn't slept, hadn't eaten. And he found the guru there, and he said, and the guru asked him, how badly do you want to be successful? And the young man said, very badly. And the guru pointed, and he said, walk out into the water. And so the young man began walking out to the water, and the water rose to about the waist level. And the young man started to question, is the guru crazy? But the guru said, walk out a little further. So the young man walked out a little further, and the water rose to about the shoulder area. At this point, the young man realized the guru was crazy. He was making money, but he was crazy. And so the guru said, walk out a little further, and the young man walked out a little further, and the water rose to about the mouth. At this point, the young man was about to turn back. But the guru said, I thought you wanted to be successful. And the young man said, I do. And so the guru said, walk out a little further. And so the young man walked out a little further, and the guru grabbed him, and he pulled him down under the water. And he held him down. And he held him down, and right before the young man was about to pass out, he raised him up. And he said, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you will be successful. Now, this last line may be familiar to some of you, as it is what rings home in the viral story told by motivational speaker Eric Thomas. When you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you will be successful. It's catchy. It's not new information, though. I don't have to go to a guru to know that if I want to be successful, then I have to want it very badly. Passion desire, a love for something, or at the root of what motivates us to accomplish a goal. And that is what we need to focus on, because like in Thomas' story, it is not the information that it provides, but rather the emotions that it provokes that succeed in motivating us. Passion is the first emotion, the most important emotion, that I believe if we can harness it, it can motivate us to accomplish a goal. But the second emotion that I'll talk about later is our self-confidence, and how these two emotions come into play into motivating us how we can train our practice, our preparation, our mindset, determines whether all of these factors can act as a catalyst, progressing us to new heights of success, or conversely, a blockade, halting our improvement, and with it, inducing a sense of self-failure. I think it is safe to assume that everyone here desires high levels of success, and we can point to countless examples of books or media that gain national attention with the self-proclaimed secrets to success. For instance, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, a book that scrutinized the factors that go into the highest levels of success, was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for 11 straight weeks, and it sold over one and a half million copies. People want to know what goes into succeeding and yearn to uncover the secrets to mastering their field. But what do I mean when I say we all want success? And what kind of success do you desire? When I say we want to succeed, I'm really pointing to the goals we have for ourselves on any level. It can be a small goal, such as doing your homework for a class that you particularly don't want to do it for, or a big goal, such as playing a sport at a Division I level. Either way, when we set a goal, we attempt to take the invisible and make it visible, or take whatever we're dreaming of, whatever our goal is, and make it a reality. So then, what is the secret to success? And if we magnify that and look at what the best of the best did, the outliers, Steve, Ga uh, Steve, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, how did they get to where they are? Well, what do you often hear? That they were the most talented, the most intelligent, the most athletic in terms of sports. But as we look deeper and we analyze how each one of those geniuses did what they did, we realize that talent is just a placeholder. Talent is defined as a natural aptitude or skill. But was Michael Jordan naturally born knowing how to be the best basketball player in the world? Or were the Beatles naturally so gifted that they were destined to emerge as cultural icons. Anders Ericsson, in his book Peak, argues no. And he talks about how consistently and overwhelmingly the evidence shows that experts or masters in a field are made 
not born. He debunks the notion that the most successful people are just born into that destiny, and rather proves how their mastery is a result of a specific set of factors. So then what are those factors? Well, he simply attributes it to time spent practicing, but not just any old practice, deliberate practice. What do most of us do when we practice? We repeat the things that are enjoyable, the things that we know, the things that are easy. What is deliberate practice? It's different. It requires conscious focus on the things that we are bad at, or the things we are weakest in, or the things that we can't do at all. And research across all domains shows that only by focusing on what you can't do can you turn into the expert you want to become. And Erickson is not alone in this conclusion, as Gladwell had similar findings in his uncoverings to the secrets of success. Gladwell stated that, quote, 10,000 hours of practice is the magic number of greatness. Again, reinforcing Erickson's claim, experts are made, not born. So just based on the most widely accepted scientific findings, if I want to become an expert in basketball, in chess, in playing the piano, then I need to devote 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to doing so. And that is a lot of time. That is, as Gladwell says, 10 years of working a job every day, 9 to 5. And I'm 16 years old, so for me to claim to be a master of anything, then I would have needed to start practicing what I want to master every day, 9 to 5, since I was 6. And how many people in society, 6-year-olds, have done or are doing that? In fact, if anyone here can first claim they had a clear goal at the age of 6, and secondly, tell me that they were able to devote that much time to achieving it, then by all means, take a nap, rest, shut your eyes during this talk, because it is an exhausting amount of time. The result is what we all crave, but it is only the product of all of those hours of practice. But what we may su find surprising is that it has been done before. Who's heard of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart? He's perhaps the perfect example, as he is typically presented as a child prodigy with exceptional innate musical genius. But what's often forgotten is that his development was equally exceptional for the time. Before he was four years old, he started hours of practice under the tutelage of his father, a skilled composer and music teacher. So it was no surprise that by the time he started to perform at age six or seven, he was on his way to mastery, being uh, taught by someone who was highly motivated to get him to a high level. He's exactly what Gladwell and Erickson mean. He was not born a musical genius. He rather got there through intense hours of deliberate practice from the age of three. And the same theme holds true, whether we look at the emergence of Bill Gates to the Beatles. If you put in the time and the deliberate practice, then you will achieve your goals on any level. So the question comes then, if we have a template for success, uh, a procedure, why do we so often quit or why do we so often fail? We have all the information on what success requires, yet we still find ourselves unmotivated, unable to apply ourselves. Well, it really isn't that simple. It's not as simple as having the steps, the procedures, the resources, because if we are not resourceful ourselves, then it does no good. What we need to focus on when we analyze what leads to success are the emotions that come into play. Action is not driven by having the knowledge of how to do something. And trust me, because I'm a master procrastinator. Action is driven by the inner forces, our willpower, our internal drive. Action is driven by emotion. And that is not just my opinion, as we can look to biology to support that notion. Here, if you look at this highly detailed image of the human brain, you see that it's primarily composed of two parts. First, the neocortex, our recently evolved part of the brain, responsible for all of our higher order thinking, all of our rational and analytical thought. And the second part is our limbic system. What is it responsible for? All of our drives, all of our emotions, and all of our behaviors. So naturally, if we want to influence a change in action, a change in behavior, then we must not appeal to the rational part of the brain that has the information on how to do so, but rather to the limbic system, that part of the brain that is controlled by emotions. So therefore, if we can harness those emotions that are our motive for action, then we can will ourselves to work through pain, adversity, failure, boredom, and take whatever that invisible want is and make it visible. Take whatever that goal is and make it a, dream, uh, make it a reality. So. Emotions are the cause of action. What emotions am I going to focus on? Passion. It's obvious. If you're passionate, if you're enjoying something, then you're motivated to keep doing it. Find your passion 
and run with it. It's a special thing to find that one, two, three things in life that you're willing to sacrifice for in return for that enjoyment. And for the best of the best, it's more than just a passion. It's a mindset that goes with that, what I call a scarcity mindset, a term often used in economics. Scarcity means when you don't have enough resources to fulfill the need. So then what is the response? What happens? Well, all of our energy is focused on fulfilling that need. All other priorities are ignored, and we physically cannot stop thinking about it. How did Isaac Newton devise his laws of motion? He said, my powers are ordinary. Only my application brings me success. He was constantly and constantly applying himself with all energy on the goal of discovery. He had a scarcity mindset. Scarcity of time. What happens when you waited until November 15th to write a TED Talk that was due November 16th? And this goes for all procrastinators out there. What, what's the response? You go into overdrive, right? You focus all attention on completing that goal. You get a scarcity mindset, tunnel vision, as the book Scarcity describes. And the same goes for scarcity of food, scarcity of air. If you're starving or if you can't breathe, what is the body's natural response? To focus all attention on fulfilling those needs. So naturally, if you can find a passion so deep that in that you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you will be successful. But the second emotion that I think, if we can harness it, can influence our motivation, our ability to will ourselves immensely, is our self-confidence. Right? We all know that if our self-confidence is high, if we're seeing progress, if we're seeing improvement, or we're succeeding, then we are more motivated to put in the time, the practice, the deliberate practice, the requirements that success uh, that we need to put in to have success. Uh, consider this. If two students take a preliminary quiz in biology, the first gets an A, the second gets a C, which student is going to be more motivated to succeed, to do better, to put in the time that success on the next quiz requires? The first one, obviously, but why? because their expectation of themselves is higher, their belief in themselves is higher, their self-confidence is higher, as opposed to their counterpart. In sports, in basketball, what changes from game to game, from performance to performance? Not physical ability. Rather, performance is usually a reflection of self-confidence, certainty in what you're doing. And the best of the best can and will make those immediate changes and because they know what emotions are affecting them and they know what techniques to improve what techniques they can use to improve self-confidence. So then, what are some techniques that we can use in everyday life to improve our self-confidence? First one, the power of self-talk. We all have a self-talk that runs in our head, right? And when we perform poorly, what happens? People doubt us. And when people start to doubt, you have to have an, a self-affirmation, a saying that you, it runs in your head, a self-talk that reaffirms your faith in yourself. What's the best example? Muhammad Ali, what was his self-affirmation? I am the greatest. He said it before every fight, and people started to believe him. If you can find that belief from within, and not just from what other people think, and not just from your past performances, then you empower yourself, you motivate yourself. So find a self-affirmation, and you find the motivation to, uh, to succeed in whatever you want to do. So next, what's the second thing? continue to practice in times of low confidence, right? What do we all do when we fail or we reach adversity? We get that pit in the back of our throat, we get down on ourselves, or we get, emotion, or we get angry. Channel that emotion, right? How did Michael Jordan uh, succeed? He said that he's failed over and over, but he used that failure as motivation to continue. So if we can learn how to channel that emotion, that, uh, that failure, then we can learn how to improve our self-confidence, take that and use it as motivation to achieve an end. The next and the last thing, often we find that to be the hardest thing to do, right? How do we take uh, ourselves in times of failure, in times of adversity, when our confidence is low and force ourselves to apply time? Well, find a mentor. A mentor can focus you on times when you don't feel like you have to practice, when you don't feel like you want to practice. They, they uh, why does, look at Mozart. Why did he succeed? Because he had a uh, role model. He had his father, who was dedicated on transforming him into a musical genius. If we look at why tutors are successful in school, what do they do? They make you focus on the things that you're weakest in, and at the same time, they build up your self-confidence. And we all know that it is hardest to practice right after we fail, right after uh, our self-confidence is very low. So then how can we do that? Find a mentor. 
So then, what is the total takeaway from this? Well, we have a template for success. And whether that's at a high or a low level, what it boils down to is how willing we are to commit time and deliberate practice to achieving that desired outcome. But time and deliberate practice are only one part of the equation. What's powering that? What's the engine behind the car? It's an emotion that drives us to apply ourselves. And what two emotions are they? Passion and self-confidence. So I challenge all of you, be conscious of how your self-confidence affects your, your habits of practice. Find your passion. Find how you can harness those emotions that are your motive for action. And I have the utmost faith that the sky will be the, only the beginning of the limit for you. Thank you.